So my talk is titled Securing Open Source One CD at a Time. So to just understand the audience, I want to ask. So just raise your hands if you know what CD is, or I have heard what CD is. All right. Okay. So I'll just start with a brief introduction about myself. My name is Mukti. I am the founder of Linux. Linux is a micro ISP. This is this is basically like a micro ISP, basically solving hard software problems for companies and sometimes legally legally hack them. Is fun. And I love competitions, which is what I'm mostly known for. Um, so, as of recent, was last year, I was the gold medal winner of uh, World Skills Competition, which is basically the Olympics of skills. So, it's like Olympics is for sports, World Skills is for basically vocation skills. So, I represented India and South Korea and ranked eight for our country. And Brick Skills too, which is basically the five leading economies uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. I won bronze for India. And as this is conducted by Force United, uh, in the recent Force Act 3.0, uh, I won for DNR3. As in, I was with my team, we wake and shut. So, yeah, that's about it. So, what is this talk about? So, I worked in open source security research, working with a company called Hunter Hotel, which is basically an open source security triaging platform. So, what they do is basically provide an incentive for researchers, security researchers, and also maintainers to basically secure their open source libraries, projects, or whatever. So, during my time there, I was responsible for validating, writing, and publishing 300 plus CVEs, which is basically the one piece in open source. Every security loop or uh, that you find like zero days, everything uh, in open source, I was responsible for 300, 300 plus of it. And also personally took my time to patch 50 plus the CVEs in open source. Yeah, so and most, most if not all of them are on GitHub. So if you want to check it out as a learning material, you can, you can do that. Just use this code, you can just Foreign HSEC is the organization that index under our dev, the platform. So you can use these GitHub queries to see my patches and my trials. So everything is open source uh, from reporting to validating to publishing the CDE and also patching the volunteers. Everything is open source, so you can check them out. Yeah, so just to get you all started, I'll just introduce some terminologies and like, explain what they are. So CDE, as I said, uh, the one I asked if you know, is common already sent as pushes, which basically is just an ID or like an identity that you give to a particular one of the people. So like, let's say, I guess, like, Lodash, if you know what Lodash is, or like Nginx, it's a vulnerability, it would be assigned a CVE. For like CVE, then the year, so 2023, and then some ID, so 1337 or something, would be the ID of the security vulnerability that the Nginx has. So this basically is identification for us. And CVSS is the common vulnerability scoring system, which basically makes, like, ensures the, what the severity of the vulnerability is. So just starting from low, medium, high, and critical would be the levels, which is determined by multiple factors. Like if it can be exploited by physically or like through the network, uh, all basically changes the severity of the vulnerability. So responsible disclosures, basically responsibly disclosing a vulnerability to the maintainer or vendor of the software product. So it doesn't mean, and also one thing is like CVEs doesn't mean it is only associated with open source software. It can be other software as well, and it has happened, but it's mostly used for open source software. And VDP is the vulnerability disclosure program, which almost like big companies all conducts them. Google has a program called Google VRP. It's a vulnerability research program, which basically rewards researchers to finding executed loopholes. Like if you hack Google, they will give you money for it, basically. Um, the bug bounty is the name for that. So like if, it, if you, let's say, if you find a vulnerability in, a, in Google, let's say in Google Drive, you are able to read anyone's file. If you do that, you will get like bounties ranging from ten thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars, if not more, if you find like a critical one like RC. So zero day. I didn't describe it, so I want to like tell you what a zero day is. So zero day is when a vulnerability is vulnerability at hand is not in awareness of the company or the maintainer. Like no one basically knows. Everyone knows about it on the same day. So what happens is like the log for the one. How many of you heard about the log for the vulnerability? Yeah, so that was a zero day. So what basically happens is like, let's say, um, like a lame example or something, like today I found a moment in Nginx. So Nginx almost like every single website runs Nginx, so popular, uh, even just take Apache for example. And I find a moment where like, if a website is running Nginx, I can just issue a request and then get RCE on the server that's hosting it. RCE means I can execute commands on it. So I can, I can just get in, get do whatever I want. And what I do is like, I just post it on Twitter instead of Nginx and it would be to the public. So someone who's malicious can use that 
uh, and obviously manage people are the ones who find the public zero days. Yeah, so what's the current state of open source security? From my time working there, uh, you know, from things I have seen, you know, uh, you know, war flashbacks, if you can say, uh, the things that I've seen, like, there are two types, basically. Uh, the one is like when the zero drops, like, some random library which is meant to be meant to read PDFs uh, somehow can execute system commands, no one knows why, and then so, someone basically hacks them, and then every single website is using it. So that's what happens. Like image magic, for example, gets hacked all the time. But like every single like image manipulation program behind the scenes, even if it's not JS, whatever, they're using image magic, magic like behind the scenes. It's like if like every single HTTP request client, they would say they wrote it, like in Python and JS or whatever. Like behind the scenes, if you click behind the curtains, they're using curl. So uh, basically, like that. if you find a one of in curl, every single every single other thing is one of that. Um, and there are good Samaritans, and I'm a big fan of them, and I'm also one of them. That's what the 50 plus CV is matching us. So basically, what happens like when image patching gets vulnerability, like someone saw that and like okay, I should patch it immediately because maintainers like you cannot really say like maintainers would would have something else. Like they're not entitled to completely work on them, right? So someone else can issue a PR and then fix it. Uh, even if it's not landed, some other companies could basically fork the person's repo and then pass it on. So the process of managing one of these, right? So if, if you see the diagrams, like, you know, this tower, assets, report, the media, verify. Uh, but the thing is, this is just corporate UML diagram. Like, this is BS, basically. This is not how the entire thing works. You know how it works? I will just say. So, Somewhere, somewhere, okay, get bored. And conveniently, in the middle of Christmas vacation, okay, <laughs> and what this person does is that, oh, the person is bored, looks something, and maybe goes to, I don't know, NPM, and then picks a library with like 69 million downloads. How convenient. A lot of people are using it. And then finds a zero day on it, RCE perhaps, and then just looks at it, ah, that's pretty good. And then goes to some kind of shady forum, and then like, Okay, engineers for learns, do it whatever you want. This is basically how security works. And then I will say the whole process, like UML diagrams, like take that aside. This is what actually happens. And then the security response of big corporation. Okay, this is how it is. That uses the waiting library in the end of software. Like the basically the end of product, how it works is like because of a like some random open source library someone wrote, I don't know, ten years ago, and like haven't even had a commit in like nine years. The end of product, its core functionality is like carrying it like in its shoulders. And like that maintainer wouldn't even be aware of it. And this would be associated with like security operations center and the responder would be like conveniently all the time, middle of the specifications, cancel. Uh, and the big co corporation, of course, by the way, they the state funding. Huh? I mean, they state vacation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also not the power of Twitter. No yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So like basically, and this big corporate asset, usually what this is like you see they say funding, like big amount of funding and like uh, the, even if the mainland has like a GitHub sponsors, Patreon, buy me a coffee or whatever it is, uh, they wouldn't be on it. Uh, instead, uh, some random person is like, okay, I use this library in my uh, kids or school project, I am sponsoring you. But the big corp, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and now the mainland side, the mainland is not on social media. Uh, the mainland doesn't even know what's going on. Uh, the volunteer is said, no idea. And like, if you check their data profile, right? This is the profile picture. Is that person real? No idea. Uh, and then opens GitHub someday, and then opens issues. This is what's like 264 open issues. Security patch, ETA, when? And then the outcome is our company is dying. Please fix zero PRs. Would be like a one line fix, like no one would care. And for the uncultured, or your said basically hackers, <laughs> uh, they would be on it, on sipping their morning coffee, like, ah, poor people. Everything, like, no one cares about like actually passing anything, so this is what goes on. But the other side is this. It's a minority, but the other side is this. And those are the good semantics. So what they basically do is that, let's say you find a volunteer, you know, particularly, like, even if it's popular, even if it's, like, no one downloads it, it doesn't matter. Like, takes, take the time, in your own hands, and then just responsibly disclose the one to the main deal. So how it works is that, let's say you find out in curl, right? The author of curl is Dan Estenberg. So what you do, you email Dan Estenberg, and then say like, I found this one, it's pretty critical, and you should patch it. Um, so they have a one of the program. Most popular ones have, and what you should do is like, wait for their response, 
and you should state a one of the disclosure policies. So what so what this is is like you should say like there's n days that I would allow you to pass this or acknowledge this one of the exists at all. Uh, Google Project Zero does this. Google Project Zero is basically like a, the hack of the elite hacker team of Google. So what they do is like they they get paid to basically hack software uh, for fun. And they have this policy of 90 plus 30 policy is that they will give you 90 days to pass and acknowledge your vulnerability. And if you don't do that, they'll publicly post it. Just like the other guys, the malicious guys. Um, and 30 days from patch to public disclosure, basically. They will, uh, they will publish the details of the vulnerability. And then if, if you can patch it, if you can patch the vulnerability, you can like open a PR and do whatever, but not everything can do that, right? Like if you find a vulnerability in curl, but you did that via like request or whatever, but you don't know how to write C, then that doesn't mean you can patch it, right? So someone else could do it. So if you are able to, you could do that. And CVE goes, gets published. CVE is basically the ID for the vulnerability, and that gets published. Yeah, but there's a problem. So if you are a popular, if you're a maiden of like a very popular library, or uh, you check emails of good, like sufficiently popular companies, I don't know, you might have seen bug bounty reports. I don't know how many of you have encountered this. Uh, so this this data is from Hunter uh, where I work, and you can see that P5 is basically the low impact vulnerabilities. P5 is basically doesn't mean anything. It's not even a vulnerability. Uh, they would just report something like RCE, and then there is no code, there is no exploit. Uh, what happens is that they're just looking for like a bounty or like a CVE assigned to their name or something. So like obviously there are people like that. Uh, so most reports are P5, um, and some some of them are like actually with good in it. Uh, they are not technical, so they will see something. They will see like a stack trace or something, and they will think like, oh, it's hacked. So they will like <laughs> report it. Uh, you can see that in their replies. Like, I don't know what's going on, but I think it's hacked. You know, in, in movies, it's like a terminals and like green text on thing. So they see code and think, okay, that's hacked. Uh, so that those are the P5s. Uh, P0 is like absolutely critical. So it's like if you don't patch it today, like some companies are going <laughs> going underwater basically. Yeah, so the main inner side. Um, so that would be applicable to most of you, I would assume. Uh, so what happens is that when you receive a vulnerability, there are things that you should make sure. The first one is that if there is no POC, just proof of concept, someone reports a vulnerability. Like they say, like there's a particular vulnerability in your library, um, and then you should fix it. If there's no POC, you should probably not even like take it seriously. Like I, I know you'd be like pretty scared of it. Like when someone reports you like there's an RC in your uh, library or something, you'd be pretty panicked. But if there's no POC, you should ask for it. And if they don't proceed, proceed with it, like just ignore. Uh, so the reason why I'm saying that is like I worked on the maintainers of the, the triaging side and then we get a lot of reports. Like basically just no POC, no nothing. So like if we think that like okay we think it's critical. Like this is like a big library, right? Uh, like let's say like Lodash or something, and then they get a report and they're like, okay, we should take this seriously, and then we should like like reach out every time. Like, can you provide the POC? Can you provide the exploit code? They still don't get on with it, and then we realize like they're basically a troll. Like they don't they're not looking for anything. So you should do not waste your time. Just adopt this concept called POC or get the fuck out basically. Yeah. So that is the spamming problem, the P5 ones, as I said. Uh, and then you should ask the researcher, the the one who discovered the one of the for mitigation suggestions. Because I will get to that later on. Because if you're not really exposed to like security concept, like secure secure coding, best practices, and stuff like that, your fits will be bypassed like ten times. Like if you fix the vulnerability and then you post it, someone else would come and hack it. And like this is like new fits. What are you doing? <laughs> because like if you're not exposed to that security side of things, you will like miss some of the like nasty exposure. Like, which I will show you a demo. Then you will realize how cursed the world of security is. So then you patch it. And then what you should do is immediately publish a new release. So when you publish a new release, uh, semantic versioning or just publish a new release, and then just document the changes that you made. Like this is what I get, this is what I did, and this is to acknowledge the patching of CVE ID. So CVE is like really important. The reason why I say that is like you can just patch one of the for no reason or like just not publish at all. But you should publish a CVE. The reason why is that there are threat intelligence feeds. Uh, that is also corporate BS, but at least it, there's a there's a legit like applicability in this. The reason why is that uh, they're like the threat feeds, like a real time threat feeds. Uh, they say it's real time, but it's two weeks later. But at least they will say like the curl has been like received with like a, a big one, but should patch it. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be knowing. Like they're not scrolling like Reddit and GitHub, like you know, like like us. So yeah. 
So from doing that, you are saving some machines, you know, from working the Bitcoin mines. Yeah. So the next step is like this is the like someone sends you the report and then you like pass it. Like that's like so surface level. But if you want to prevent it, like if you want to prevent from getting hacked, uh, there are some things that you should take care of. Um, the thing is, you can never be like 100% secure. That's like a fallacy. There's no way you can do that. Uh, but there are some things that you can focus on because you can prove that it's safe by some like quantifiable method. Uh, some of them are sensitive machine disclosures. So like, if you have in your code, like, if you push a code and then you accidentally like push like an API key or like any sensitive token, uh, that is that is a problem. Uh, then for infrastructure systems like SSS vulnerabilities, so like you can prove that it's secure against you. Um, not if you're using like a web application firewall. I'm saying like if you're actually like escaping the input, like HTML escaping, it is sure. Like there's no way you can bypass that. So things like that. Um, there's like memory safety, which I don't know if I could say that here. I mean, it's like a cultish thing. But uh, and the thing is like if you're like, some people can write hundred percent secure CC for stuff. I don't know. Maybe they can. <laughs> but you should use like you know UV sand, like anti friendly behavior sand, like like housing suits because like Home Plus and Apple. Uh, I think yeah, Home Plus is by Google. Uh, those are really good. And no, Rust is not the answer. Uh, <laughs> if, you're <laughs> that, uh, if you're starting with Rust, fine. But if you're gonna rewrite, like if you're gonna open an issue, it's like can you rewrite Chrome in Rust, please, man? Like that's not gonna happen. Maybe like GPTCs with like one million contacts, maybe, but I don't think that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just document some tools. Uh, you can utilize in your internal tooling or whatever. Uh, so this is to prevent sensitive info leaks. So like if you accidentally publish like a secret key, like Firebase API key, or, like let's say you Stripe the API key. I don't know if you can you can steal your money with it. Uh, so things like that, um, even even if it's like like DB, like database transfers, everything, don't hard code it first of all. But there are some scenarios where you have to. So I would suggest you use no C and Git leaks. Uh, both of them are very popular. So what it does is like you set set them as like a Git hook, which would scan for these credentials existing in the source code, and you can prevent them from committing basically. And uh, this this is a repo called key hacks. Um, Key hacks is basically like a list of API endpoints. You can ensure that the API key is valid because you might have like dummy keys, right? Uh, like dummy keys, like one, two, three, or something which matches the same kind of like hash or like format of the API key. So you would like force positive basically. So if you want to prevent that, you can use key hacks to check that the leaked key is valid and use environment variables. Like, why would you do like hard coding? There are scenarios, but still, yeah. There are scenarios? Yeah. It's like like single file, like if you want to run it in a single file, or like you are compiling something, and like basically like out of system. If you run in like a VM setup or like uh, what is that thing called? Fire thing? Fire VM? Fire VM or something? Yeah. So there's like a secure environment where you can we cannot do any kind of like interact with these system things. Oh. So you have to hard code them. I mean, still you can like XOR and like obfuscate it, but that just makes a reverse engineer feel more challenged to. So. <laughs> yeah. So input validation never trust any really user input. Um, you like I will show you actual scenarios after this, so you can realize how serious this is. So you can use this code queues by GitHub. It's really cool actually. Um, code queues basically like a code scanner, like a semantic code scanner. You will it will find like one or two code parrots uh, in source code. Doesn't matter how big your code base is, it is still does. And the, the cool thing is this, is that they have an incentive for security researchers where they pay security researchers for finding like rules for these semantic properties. Like if I write a rule to find SSRFs, I will get paid for it. And in Sengrub is uh, semantic, uh, semantic group, that's what it's for. Uh, there is this this is awesome website called Sona Rules. Um, basically, it's, uh, it's by Sona Q, you know, uh, both of them open source. So in this rules one, you can just read through them like uh, for your particular language that you use. Uh, you can read them and then see like okay there are this one of these and this is how you pitch them so like the one of the code and the pitch code are like in a list so it's a really good resource if you want to learn security uh so this is the core suit that i would recommend uh player is for uh, docker containers like if you have misconfigured containers you can use that um open source is for mobile apps uh like Kotlin java the bandit and finds and bugs are for java uh, Node.js scan is obviously for Node.js, Git leaks, I just explained. Compass is for buzzing. Uh, this is only applicable for like compiled languages, like Golang, C, C, Postgres. Um, I mean, Rust is like, I don't know, memory safe, right? So you don't need fuzzing? I don't know. Yeah. So basically, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Yes. Now gets to the interesting part, right? So second coding isn't that easy. I said that, right? So if you look at this code, right? What's the problem with this code? Can anyone guess? Can anyone know? Does anyone know about this? I'll just say like pickle is the keyword here. If you know. So I'll just get to it. So I don't know. How many of you use pickle? How many of you know what serialization and deserialization is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So it's basically like a serialization thing, like they would take an object, take it into a language that type, can convert it to in the by sequence or whatever it is, whatever format it prefers. The problem with this is that this is like extremely unstable. So like you can basically pass a payload and then get whatever you want. You can execute system commands and whatever. And the thing is, the way you fix this, it's like this. This is how you fix it. So like it is now in the documentation, but it wasn't. So like everyone gets hacked and then we would say the main thing, like whatever, like this is one of the people is here, you should fix it. And they would come like, so the library doesn't handle this? Um, no, still doesn't. And then you have to implement this. So like you have to basically do like, these are the same written functions you could use, and these are the only things that are allowed to be serialized, and this is the only way to fix this. Now, how about a personal experience, right? So I can talk from my heart, right? <laughs> so like, you know, like a, like a piece of paper from my own book, right? So see this. So I was working at this XYZ company. Uh, it is a security company. So there is a microservice which basically takes a screenshot of any URL. So like, it has to be public facing, of course. Uh, so you can, if you do Google.com, it will take a screenshot and comes back to you. So basically, it uses a headless Chrome to do that. It takes a screenshot. Uh, this is not the real code, of course. I'm not gonna do that. But like, this is like a dummy code to just make you understand like, what what it does. So you basically give it a URL. It will take a screenshot, comes back to you, right? And this is how it works. You provide like Google.com, Zomba.com, or whatever. It will provide you with a screenshot. Now, the thing is, this is one of the called SSRFs. So SSRF is basically server-side request forgery. So if I give in like a local host IP, like a local IP, you can take a screenshot and give it back to you. That is running on the server, right? Now let's say there is a admin panel, like only accessible internally or whatever. Uh, this internal services, anything, you can access that. You can take a screenshot, see what's up, see what's going inside. You can pick that and comes back, right? So this was, that was one of the trick. And now, so this guy is a developer, right? I'm working in security. So this guy, I have to validate the code is like safe before you push in production, right? So this guy comes in, I'm like, okay, so I said like, you, this shouldn't access in general, but that's like serious. So we block the local host, right? 127 local host, like, right? So like, a blacklist, so like you don't allow them to secure, right? But like, I had to have the talk with him, you know? And that's when he realized the code, you may need to see man-made orders beyond your comprehension by the product that is true. You know why? Because I showed him this. This is how IP works, right? From multiple types of stuff. And this is not even it. You can do multiple other things. You say Chrome's IP URL parser is like weird. So you can, there's like multiple ways to do that. So the guy comes in again. So we only allow HTTP as public domains, which is actually pretty good. I mean, like that's that's pretty good. So like our clients obviously would have SSL. I mean, they, would, they wouldn't come to a security company without an SSL, I mean, like, come on. Uh, so that's a public domain. So if it has an HTTP and it is a public domain, they can access it, right? Well, how about, let's let's get this, right? I'll register a website called urnuwada.com, right? <laughs> and then what do I do, right? You hit the website with a request, whatever endpoint it may be. It will respond with a 301 permanent redirect. You know to work? Local host. So that's, you know, the basic YouTube works. I mean, that's the reason why I work in security. Um, because like, it's so fun, man. Like to see the pain, uh, I mean, like, you know, you get the point, right? Ah. So basically it makes my heart work. Yeah. Uh, the fix to this one of these is basically like simple as that. Like pass the IP, get from the host name, and then check if it's private. But, what if some kid somewhere gets bored, looks at the IP address model by Python, and then bypasses the IP parser? Um, I don't know. That's when you have another problem. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is just another two step problem. You know why? There's a one of the people called a Zip which is basically like if you URL. 
Archeo, yeah. If you archive like a zip file, you can basically set like sim link to Etsy password or like some somewhere outside the working directory or whatever it is. You can extract that file and then get it to a zip. So if it's a web service, you can continually do that, like basically like leak any file in the uh, file system. So this bug was in a Rust zip parser. So I took my time and then fixed it. So I, I went ahead and then checked, uh, checked like it wouldn't be allowed to like go past the working directory. So that was the kind of the fix. And I also done with like sim links. So it wouldn't do that either. So it wouldn't read any file in there. But three months later, right? The pattern says, you can see there's no profile photo. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Sometimes I've seen like, more ways to zip to see. I mean, like, you're challenging me. I work in security, right? So that hurts me. Like, okay, more ways. What do you mean? And then the person was right. That, that person like basically demonstrated like five other ways you can exploit that. Like bypassed my face like obliterated it. My my face is nothing basically. But I, I, I don't like that. So you know what I did? I literally read like unzip the utility in like units. And then run the code like how do they handle this, how do they handle this, and like I implemented all of that in the Rust library. So like, because I don't like that. I work in security, and that guy could pass it. Nah. So I went ahead, took my time, and then this is like a big PR. So I basically fixed like every possible way like this trip could happen. And then. <laughs> 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 I saw that it was in a different repository, oh. not in my code. So like I was like, that's good, right? Yeah. But like I was like reading the thread, the whole thread, what are they talking about? Like they're talking about like zip security, something, I don't know. So I was looking at that and uh, and one thing, uh, my fix was actually one of the zip bomb attacks, uh, but I didn't admit to that, uh, but I did fix it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but fortunately no one finally so like, you know, if my fix is bypassed two times, that's not, you know, so like I fixed it myself. But then I was looking at the thread and like, they were talking, this, this is how it looks. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is the internal sort of like a zip parser, like, I fixed the zip parser, yeah. But then after seeing this, what do you mean logarithm increase in zip form? I don't know. Uh, dude, I, I saw this and I was like, I'm not touching a zip parser ever again. Uh, I quit and uh, I'm not touching that ever again. I don't know what's going on here some academic researchers, I don't know, right? So here's what you should actually focus on. I showed that to demonstrate that secure coding is not like, it's basically impossible. Like I work in security and I face it, like this has happened like multiple times. I face the vulnerability, some, some person comes in, like finds a bypass, it's like some weird payload. Like if you add like one at the end of the string, it bypasses it, nobody knows why. Like it's like, it's that's how it works. So this is what you should do as a media. So you should create a file called security.md uh, just like the license run empty file to communicate like okay this is how you should report the vulnerability and this is the format that you should do it uh, if you want the report to be DDP encrypted that's uh, a lot of people do that um, and and another thing is if you're a profitable company and you have a lot of like open source projects you should start up a bounty program so the reason why is that it basically pays for the researcher like if i'm the one who finding a vulnerability and then i report it i would get paid for it so pay for my time uh, contributing to it uh, it's a really good incentive and also shows that you care for security. And you should set up internal tooling for regular like, scanning. The tools that I showed earlier, you should use that. And those are the tools that I recommend. And there are a multitude of other tools. Uh, you can write your own. Uh, even like the key hack one that I showed you, right? There is a list uh, of API endpoints and you can request them to make sure that they are valid API keys. You can basically combine them or write your own tool that does it automatically for you. Because the key hacks one is like, just a list, you have to manually do it. So none, like no tools are just for doing that. So you can write that. Um, and then you should publish CVs, which is uh, the reason why I mentioned earlier. It would be updated to the threat indulgence feed. Uh, you know, a lot of companies do that. Uh, it would be in the landing page, you know, the React, the animation thing, and then it would say like real time, but when you check the feed, it's like two weeks later, but that's real time, I guess. Yeah, it's, so that's the entire thing. So now, just to convey the impact, like I, I went through all that stuff, like passes, just show your point, like security, like secure coding is not, something that you should do. Uh, you should learn about it, like implement best practices, but 
use trolling or whatever, but like some kid somewhere is gonna hack it. Like it, there's nothing you can do. Uh, to just I have to show you like a so, small demo uh, of a zero day, which is if I show you an actual zero day, I I would FBI would open up. But <laughs> <laughs> so this this is Mufi is your live feed, right? Be careful. <laughs> yeah, so basically this is an already disclosed one. Um, disclaimer: This is an already disclosed one. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time. Yes, hey, can you increase this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And one more beautiful, beautiful thing about like live demos is that like uh, it won't work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is what the exploit looks like. Um, you know, this is what it usually looks like every exploit. There is, this, you shouldn't like look at it and try to understand it. The the trade offs like you can learn stuff, yeah, but like there's a trade off uh, which is eye damage because you look at, you screen this thing and like, like okay, yeah, fine. The, this thing is like basically executes Perl commands. Um, to just know, like, how many of you know what exit tool is? Mitch. How many of you know what exit is? Yeah, file yeah. So exit tool is basically the most popular language that handles like media, like metadata, meta everything like that. It would handle that for you. Uh, it is used in production a lot. So, yeah. Uh, also, I want to show you, like, uh, just like a hacker culture thing. When you exploit something and you show it to people, you basically like demonstrate that it's vulnerable by executing a system command. Uh, so what people usually do is like popping a shell, which means like you get a reverse shell somewhere, or popping a calc, which means you pop a calculator using its calc, so you know like it executed system commands. Uh, but I made a new thing, so I want to show that. You are going to get the curl, no? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That works. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is my new exploit. Uh, it popped the calc tradition, but uh, this thing exists, and also I don't want to disappoint the other. Uh, <laughs> you know. I have something else, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's like. And like one thing I'll show you, so I just show you the simple one of it. Like Etsy tool is like basically used in production a lot. Um, so if there is a social media, like even Facebook would use it, um, they wouldn't admit to it because like the thing is written in Perl. So FFI is out of the question. You can do that. Like that's out of the question. So the, the way that they, they use it, basically like install that and then execute it as a system command, then gets the file back to you. Uh, Etsy tool basically handles like weird file formats and stuff. So there is no way you can like write another implementation for that. It does it conveniently for you. So you, a lot of people use etc. And then one of them <coughs> is GitLab. So this is a open a report to GitLab. Um, so this is the same algorithm. Uh, GitLab used etc to remove and add method identifiers. Uh, so what this guy did is basically the same as what that I showed you. Uh, instead of, you know, cat popping, he actually got into the servers, no reports and stuff like that. Maybe he did, I don't know. Yeah, but <laughs> basically he got paid twenty thousand dollars for it uh, because he has a bug bounty program. So I showed this to you for two things to show you like how impactful this is. Like if you have a zero day in your hands, um, you shouldn't admit to it. I don't have it. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> you shouldn't admit to it. That's what, that's what you should <coughs> responsibly disclose it. Like if you want to make your hardware best, you can also publish it on like Twitter or something and then. I'll be like, I found a vulnerability. I don't know if the major knows it or something. And then some someone picks it up from, I don't know, some shady forum in Russia or something, and then basically run it on a server, like a botnet, and then basically like sweep the entire IP, whoever's vulnerable gets it. Uh, that That's how Log4j works. It's like basically like, like Satya. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets it. Everyone gets it, right? Yeah. I didn't sleep for two days when the Log4j came. Uh, so this talk was basically get trauma up and you are a therapist, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so that was it. And if you have any questions, I don't know if I went too quick, but yeah, uh, if you have any questions, um, I don't know if you get this, but like, hey, make like, ama, like, 